Hello, welcome back to another episode of the All Jazz Podcast. We have like, again, I told you, always special guests here. I don't know, every, there's so many special people in my life, uh, even if we met only a few times, but we have Martin Hansen from Sweden. Ooh. Yeah, we're not gonna call him the sad clown anymore because he's done all sorts of other stuff in between, but it is an important thing in your life, that character. Yes. So welcome. Thank you, thank you. You, um, you know, I, I've researched a little bit because I knew you from the magic perspective. You talked a little bit more uh, what you do in Sweden. We can talk about later about the university program and all that stuff. But immediately when you were at the magic Amsterdam magic show, next to me being flabbergasted and 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 let's say, uh, what's the word when I was. Uh, I don't know. Fanboying on Tom Stone because that was an evening that oh, you both. I, were <laughs> I thought you were gonna say bored. No, no, no. I'm, I was I'm kinda, glad you didn't say bored. No, no. I was fanboying, and Fritz remembers also. Like, yeah, come on, you should be, you're embarrassing me here. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, I remember having so many great conversations with you. Uh, also, quite late in the evening. Yep. Uh, that was fun. That yeah. was that was fun, and that's where I really felt the first connection, and we kind of kept our private, not, not also, also the magic, but. Uh, but we haven't seen each other for more than I think two years now. I think no, there was been. some kind of virus in the way. Something yeah. happened. Something ha it's still going know. around. I don't know what it was, but but uh, and and you've gotten healthier. I see in the meantime as well. Yep. What was that about? Do you have you felt suddenly uh, you you were were you like teased at home or? <laughs> I was teased as a boy. <laughs> nah, I was getting older. Uh, the joints are starting to suffer really. Yeah, bad. and you're a big and, person uh, in yeah. general, huh? You need it. Yeah, so I, uh, to save my joints, my doctors told me that you will be in a wheelchair in 15 years if you don't do anything about this. So we don't have to go in specifics you want, but you're healthier. Yeah, so I t decided to uh, to take care of the, the problem, uh, which I still am. and I'm, I'm yeah, it, it becomes a lifestyle now. Yeah. You have to live differently than you did before. And, yeah. and But beautiful, beautiful, my friend. It's really, I'm so happy to see you. Like yeah. when you walked here in the sun, and unfortunately I couldn't pick you up, uh, but uh, you... Walked in the sun now in your camouflage yes, jacket. Yes, I was trying to hide. <laughs> but you were quite successful because these trees here are quite matching today. Yeah, you, yeah that's part of Swedish camouflage. You know, <laughs> never be seen. Oof. Beautiful. <laughs> now, what I want to start talking about first is like, you know, you're a magician. We have here magician guests. I'm a magician. But uh, in reality, I want to meet the person always, you know, even in my private life, when we meet magicians, I want to know the person. Yep. And that's why we got along with Fritz immediately, because he also doesn't like to hang out with anybody who's a magician if he wasn't, wouldn't hang out with them if they're not a magician. Yeah, um, yeah. That's kind of a good, good rule to have. Yeah, that's true. And uh, we had deep conversations already today. We kind of like used some uh, material up, but we're going to yeah. try to br bring some stuff back. <laughs> The first thing I want to talk to you about before we go to your magic uh, and how you maybe like the cliche story, how you started and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, I want to point out one little thing I managed to find out that I didn't know before uh, about uh, your magic endeavors. And that is that you have, in fact, been pretty prominent in the last 12 years or even more now going to Japan, working with um, elderly people who have dementia. Yes. And that it actually works. And you're just trying to discover how and, and where and why. You could apply this together with music treatment and yeah it uh oh that's a long story it but go, uh, i'm, I'm going to shut up now because <laughs> I, I like to talk a lot but this is also why i do this podcast so i can learn to listen and go yeah, right go right ahead I, uh, I don't know 15 years ago i was working as a bar magician in in stockholm and um we i remember this day quite clearly it was a monday evening we just opened up and uh, we open up for business, and this Swedish guy uh, comes down there in the basement, and he says, "Do we have a do we have a table for six people?" And I go, "Yeah, sure, I'll fix it." And he mm -hmm. goes, "Do you serve traditional Swedish food?" And I go, "Yes, we do." And he and he goes, "Yeah, I'll, I'll be back in in half an hour." And uh, this guy, whose name is Gustav Strandell, uh, nowadays a very close friend of mine. Uh, apparently he lives in Japan, so he came down, he was back in Sweden with five Japanese uh, friends, mm -hmm. and they all work with uh, elderly care, and uh, they're doing research in dementia and Alzheimer's and stuff like that. And I was performing to them that night, and... Uh, but you didn't know, or like it's the video I showed, I watched, or we can also show it, 
later on or just link it is uh, talking about you being surprised about that you didn't know that you're going to perform for no uh, <laughs> uh basically what happened is that they said we would like to take you to japan and i say yeah sure cool so um one week later there was a ticket in the mail and uh, i was all i knew was that i was going to do 16 shows in 30 days uh so i traveled to japan and uh I remember the first morning uh, they woke me up at eight and said, okay, it's time <laughs> to do your first show. And uh, we I had a big party the night I came. So so I was a little also bit... Also that, uh, oh my God. Yeah, okay. I was a bit hungover and jet lagged. And uh, so I said, okay, give me, um, give me a half an hour. Was know? that a first sign? Uh, what is the magic show at eight, nine in the morning? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't really understand this, but I was like, okay, just, just do it. So, uh, and I had my bag packed. I was, so I took a shower, you know, drank some water, and brushed my teeth, and went like, "Whoa!" And they picked me up and they drove me down away for I don't know an hour, and we um, down into this underground garage, and then into an elevator, and then up and into an office where I was served tea. And then they came and they said, "You're on in five minutes." And I said, "Okay." <laughs> How big is the audience? What am I doing? Am okay. I doing close up? Am I doing stage? And they go, "No, you're doing stage." And I go. Ooh. And okay. I brought my, my close-up stuff. Oh my so God. I was like, okay, how long am I performing? And they go, it's your choice. And I was okay. like, well, unusual. Not, yeah, okay. So, you know, put on some stuff that I was thinking this could be, well, maybe not stage, but at least parlor size. And uh, then I brought my, ba- my bag and we went up and they opened the door and I came out on a stage and I hear my name in the loudspeakers and I look out and there's 200 Japanese people that are over 85 years old in wheelchairs. Oh my goodness. And I go, what is what? this? <laughs> and and I, I was just, I didn't really know what to do, but I, I knew I had to do something. So, so I was thinking, okay, just go you know yeah try something just do it and what uh, was your first instinct what in the mind uh my first instinct is to look where this gustav strandell is standing and i saw him in the back and i looked at him and i went what and he <laughs> just he just laughed <laughs> right you and were set up actually uh, set up. let's see you do perform now magic and Boy. i was okay so let's do it and um uh, and uh, I had a translator with me, uh, Noriko, on stage, who also spoke a little bit Swedish, mm-hmm. which was good. So I could actually tell her in Swedish um, very fast that I have no idea what I'm doing right now. Ah, so you could sneak it in, yeah. in between. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she said something very important to me. She said, well, there's a bunch of people here with dementia and Alzheimer's. So don't ask them to remember a card. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's true. So I started uh, by doing simple stuff. I made a silk disappear. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did some sponge ball things, mm-hmm. you know, visual things all the time. And I remember I had this very, very old man. It turns out he was a World War II veteran or something like that. And uh, he was in the front row and he was laughing so hard. And he was following, pointing, uh, saying things that I naturally couldn't understand. But mm-hmm. And I did my show, I think I did about 15 minutes. And then I sort of ran out of, of uh, material. material. I knew yeah. I knew yeah. I could have done more, but I would have needed to, to prepare stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was You're no Max Maven. In no, I'm, ment- I'm not Or a Max mentalist Maven. in no. general. No. Me- mentalists should, could be able to maybe pull off an hour show. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, also not with that crowd probably, yeah? No, with that crowd it was very, very different. Wow. I had I had to work And what, what happened then afterward? You had some realizations about... Yeah, the, the point is that uh, uh, just afterwards I was invited up to, uh, to the hospital boss because this was a hospital sort of. And... Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, they served me tea, and uh, he started talking. And it turns out his first question was, "How did you do it?" And I said, "What do you mean the magic?" Mm-hmm. And he goes, "Yeah, but." And then they explained to me that this person in the front row had been, as they described it, with the Japanese word I can't remember. He's been a vegetable for four years. He hasn't made no reactions s- yeah. like this. And now all of a sudden, um, he was there. 
and they asked me about the secret and i said i don't know oh, wow i have a hungover i don't know where i am i don't know what's happening here <laughs> i have no idea what happened wow. uh, and so they thanked me a lot and i got a lot of nice gifts and stuff and things and uh we went back and we went out for dinner with the guys who brought me there including mm -hmm. uh, gustav mm -hmm. and we started talking about this and we came to a couple of conclusions for an example my sponge balls and my silks are red the color red mm -hmm. and they said that's very good and i go why and it turns out that red is one of the colors that sort of really shines through dementia mm. so very often i think it's a swedish invention they are you can see in the home of a people with with alzheimer's or dementia and I have to tell you guys, I'm not an expert in no, look, Alzheimer's or dementia. So yeah, yeah, if, I, yeah. if I make no some here. mistakes here, exactly. in, and, we'll, in, uh, and I personally will do research as far as because like, yeah. it's important to my wife as well. She does a lot of uh, mental health uh, performances yeah. as well. So we'll. So anyway, what I learned was that very often they paint red stripes in on the floor, leading to the bathroom, and they mm -hmm. paint the toilet red. Okay. Because if you have dementia or Alzheimer's, you forget to go to the bathroom. Ah, accidents can happen mm -hmm. but once you see this red which is a sort of strong signal you follow it you see the toilet which is red anything toilet oh yeah i need to go to the toilet wow smart so stuff yeah, like yeah. that so apparently red is something that that triggers something triggers yeah, something yeah. um and i remember that dinner quite well we were sitting there with the doctors and stuff and people and they were all asking me and i i didn't know and i was well i think that and uh, I came into uh, the subject of misdirection, and uh, I realized that the misdirection laws that we use mm -hmm. in magic uh, actually works a lot for people with dementia and Alzheimer's. Uh, they realize, I mean, they, they can follow the magic. and They can follow the magic. We, we can misdirect, because it's sort of a ground, <coughs> it's sort of a ground uh, rule that... For an example, a hand that, that's a movement upwards is more noticeable than a movement downwards and yeah. forward beats backwards and yeah, stuff yeah. like that, you know, yeah, all this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and out of that, we started they started to discuss how they should develop this. And I said, excuse me, but uh, are all my 16 shows going to be for dementia? And, and they said, uh, well, actually, we changed your schedule. You're not doing 16 shows. And I go, oh, cool. And they said, you're doing 42. <laughs> and I go, in 30 days? And they say, yes, oh. but you have three days off. <laughs> I was like, what? In between, you squeeze even more in between. Yeah, oh, okay. and uh, I, did, I did also a lot of uh, corporate gigs when I was there. But uh, mm -hmm. I did maybe 20 uh, performances. For, for this people. type of audience? Yes. Okay. And... Uh, I know a lot of magicians who would say that oh that's a boring audience but I got mm. sort of captivated in it I I, mm. I saw something happening that I will never experience with a sort of an well a norm, ordinary ordinary audience yeah no. and uh, it was fascinating uh, and just the idea that I have to be crystal sharp in what I do and what I say mm -hmm. and uh, that I, I think that gave me also a a better perspective of me as a performer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah that was quite... Uh, That's amazing. That's amazing because my wife is, uh, like I told you before, I didn't explain too much and also we haven't talked in the podcast. Uh, come to me, jump. Um, we are uh, like really... She Personally, she's been dealing with anxiety ever since the second birth and there was a lot of, you know, discussions before... We didn't even talk about this stuff in, in Slovenia, you know, the culture is kind of more, it's a lot of taboo and whenever something, even my grandfather in the last, uh, you know, about five years in the end, although he passed away with, uh, from cancer complications, but it was, uh, he was, there was a lot of dementia going on and they actually, when I was that age, I was like, what is that now? 10 years ago, they still kind of like talked about, well, he's not okay, you know? just leave him alone like there was no like he so he mm. was more like pushed to the side and there was no talking about how to deal with a person like that or because it's a lot of you know a lot of times with dementia people around are suffering quite a lot 
and maybe dementia because when they come back to it they suffer but a lot of times the people around but that is really important to us so i hope we can kind of maybe you and petra can talk more and, and yeah. find a way how to cooperate yeah. and it is interesting i i had a lot of discussions also with with my friend gustav who is still in japan and still working uh uh, he appears sometimes on Japanese national television, and uh, oh, he's the guy in the video that spoke Japanese. Okay, yeah, in the, and he yeah. yells, he yells at the Japanese politicians because they're not taking care of their elderly and stuff like that. Um, and it's also, I find it, I mean, dementia and Alzheimer's is like that's a plague, and it's 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 tough shit. Yeah, dude. <laughs> and uh, if we can find ways of uh, Working with it, no matter yeah. if it's by medication, by therapy, yeah. by, by, by magic, closeness with people, closeness who are, with people yeah. yeah. And I know also one thing that I learned was that a lot of of the treatment for elderly people with Alzheimer's and dementia is is they massage, they contact massage you know, mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started doing my magic like that. I let them of, touch lot of, lot of all the silks. I let them, ah. you know, I, I do sp sponge balls in their in the hands. Video, yeah. is, you know, mm -hmm. amazing, yeah. And all that was like uh, very, very, very helpful and helpful. conductive too. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it was. Uh, oh, so how many times have you gone back and forth to to visit uh, Japan? Because you mentioned that in the in that video that I watched in that uh, presentation that you did that you have traveled back. Yeah, I've been fourteen times. Fourteen times. Fourteen times. So that's uh, okay. Okay. Uh, and every time I now when you go is for this reason to to work with uh, the dementia. Uh, I think I've been there for that reason, maybe ten, mm -hmm. 10 eleven twi times, and then I've I've been to. Uh, I've also been in Japan practicing Aikido, which is one of my. Uh, <clears throat> my weaknesses, I guess, <laughs> uh, my soft spots. It's your, and it's yeah. your, what, it's a part of your lifestyle already. You live it. Uh, you just, it's like you mentioned before. It's, yeah, you it's don't plan it. You don't talk about nah, doing it, and you just do it. It's just something I do. I've done it for since I was, I think, eight years old. Eight so, years. Yeah. Wow. So I've been at it for forty-one years now. So now it's more of a. And immediately, like you said, you know, immediately when you say Aikido, like me, my old uh, like teenage years, or I'm. Immediately thought of Steven Seagal, of course. That, yeah. was the, that was the first thought because I'm a 90s kid in the 90s. But uh, beautiful art because I was always like mesmerized by, you know, that idea of... Because I didn't research a lot about it, never practiced it. But the idea of but using their force and just mm. kind of redirecting. That was beautiful to watch with sometimes yeah, these masters. It's, it's fun because people, a lot of people ask me, yo, this Aikido, what is it about? What do you do? And I go, whoa bunch of people that meet up in a basement early in the morning we roll around and then we go have coffee you know and and it i don't really similar to jiu-jitsu they also say we roll around and then we have coffee yeah but, I mean they, but the jiu-jitsu guys smoke weed a lot I heard. yeah that <laughs> <laughs> well i think it doesn't really matter what you do uh as long as you you move your body if you want to yeah. go dancing go dancing yeah. if you want to yeah. do martial arts do martial arts if you want to do whatever you do yeah uh just make it a habit to do it stay and, active uh, yeah, yeah because i remember all these years that when i was mostly doing the morning practice at 5 30 in the morning and to get your ass kicked monday morning 5 30 by old men is <laughs> you not a good start of the day <laughs> well it is a good start after I the, mean, of the day afterwards you, you but, get stronger but mentally. if you start to think about that well you go to practice in sweden when it's minus 30 <laughs> degrees outside oh and you need to walk God. to the dojo <sighs> You need to just shut down and just go like, yeah, this is go. just something I do. You know, I wake yeah, up and yeah, I go yeah. to practice and I go, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that's a powerful, you know, message for young people and anybody who's, you know, like avoiding, you know, physical, because I'm, I was very active always as a teenager. Then suddenly there was a switch and I was like the art, guitar, mm. whatever. And I was like, and now with my kids growing up, I still had to start, especially with my older one being a teenager and he's also fallen out of sport now again. It's like, let's stay active. We can, me. You want to keep your dad healthy? Come run with me or yeah. do something. And yeah, and it's it's funny because we have this idea about in the, in the Western part of the world of, of martial arts. First of all, we think that martial arts is for fighting, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you see kids discussing which martial art is the most effective, and I usually say, well, well, if you compare other sports, you would never say which one is most effective: basketball or soccer. Mm -hmm. I mean. Uh, yeah, you that's a very good. It. I never heard that analogy before. Very good. Uh, it's just uh, 
uh, we do what we do. Because um, I'm guilty of this. I'm, you know, I'm a fan of MMA, like I told you, and, and watching for the last few years. And but, like I say, I'm conflicted between wanting to see beautiful techniques executed and people who are in control of their bodies, just like you know, like gymnastics or yeah. whatever. And also gymnastics, people can get really hurt doing that extreme. Oh, yeah, You're kind of, of dancing on this extreme edge of what's possible, you know, yeah. like. But then you get to the brutal part of it, and it's like sometimes because they have to, you know, finish each other, or somehow it's like, oh yeah. my god, then you see blood, and you're, oh my god, and then breaking arms that rarely happens, but it happens, or somebody kicks a shin and they check the the kick, and yeah, it's. Oh. But it, it's also like, uh, I don't know, it's for me, it's, it's. I think it's so easy. People very often come down to the dojo, and they ask me or one of my my. Uh, my teachers, whatever it is, that they ask, like, okay, so what's the most effective technique you have? And we go, like, what? Why? <laughs> Depending on, I don't know, why, what? You know, because they want to have a quick fix. Um, and if they can't learn to be fighters in a week, they're quitting. Mm. The problem is that it's so easy to, to hurt somebody else. I mean, it's you don't have to practice to hurt somebody. It's mm. On the other hand, it's really difficult how to heal people, and I think that's what what martial arts should be about. Yeah, Bu- building better people. And you know? yeah, when you practice that's this, the true art. That's really good, to, like because I also like I did karate when I was young, and it was taught to me that the reason why I'm learning is to to learn also how to avoid and how to just stay in control of your emotions, and that was just the basic teaching there. But it was something that stayed with me for a long time, and even though I don't practice. Uh, any sort of fighting or even now training or whatever it has stayed the appreciation or the just the kind of like life skills and some lessons that i got you know also like mm-hmm. that i don't want to fight when i first time when they made this this katana and they like, let's you know you're gonna kick and you know you have and then i got a kick to the body and i just kind of obviously got a liver shot because my body just ouch. shut down <laughs> ouch uh, that's never good, but but it was just you know experience that for me is like look I respect this but I'm not willing to no. fight if uh, no. or I'm but, just but also imagine imagine people that are competing in Olympic uh, let's say bow and arrow right mm-hmm. in archery I rarely think people woke up then and say yeah. Is this so you're practicing to shoot at people? Uh, how can that be? Is it effective? What kind of? Yeah. No, we shoot at we. we no, we <laughs> we don't. <laughs> maybe for, maybe to catch an animal. If I yeah, don't know, but I mean no arch- archery is a martial art. It, it is. Yeah. It comes from the war, and it's the same war, with yeah. the, with the with the Japanese budo arts, and I guess all of them. That yeah, the yes, sword arts and the, yeah. they're they're no longer meant to. Mm. We don't need that. Especially, what are you going to do against nuclear weapons or no. tanks? And no, that's a, <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. They, used no, to, they, so they I, could I, fight it out in the old days. Yeah, I think that that wh- whatever you do, just you know, practice. I I know my yeah. my teacher in Japan, Yasuo Kobayashi Sensei. He said he often gets the the question of is there an inner secret of, of learning Aikido? What's the what's the secret? Because we think in the Western world there must be a secret. Mm. It's always a secret. And he usually looks at them and he says, the secret is keiko, 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 which means practice, practice, practice. Uh, and and sometimes I tell my all younger students the same thing, especially yeah. the beginner ones. It's like there's three rules in magic or anything you want to do in life, which involves skill or getting better. Practice is the first one. Remember that. Yeah. Second one practice like yeah. you just keep doing it yeah, just yeah, the yeah. third one so they get it it's like come on it's like and then if they don't and if you, you if you pinpoint that you, that you don't say oh you're doing well you're doing great yeah you have to motivate them but then also be like look like you should be here then now if you've done a little bit like five minutes mm. three days a week you you would have held the cards or whatever the way i've, I've sent you a short video but it is what it is you know like some but it's important for me to people to especially young kids to understand that it's not this trick and the secret and the simplicity of some things and it's no, not it's, magic it's, yeah it's interesting uh, one of my favorite magicians in the world doc Eason, mm-hmm. uh he's i'm gonna quote him where he says it's not the trick it's not the trick it's not the trick <laughs> boom <laughs> Yo, man, I just, you know, this is very, uh, like, it makes a lot of sense right now to, to also mention this, but I wrote a, the, my first kind of 
small article for a magazine, the magic magazine that Rico is uh, doing, mm. a free one. It's called uh, I Practice Magazine. Check it out um, on the Invisible Practice page. Uh, but uh, he asked me to write about something, and I was like, what should I write about? And I was like, I think I want to write about, uh, you know, I just at that time reread some excerpts from Our Magic, from uh, Mescaline and Levine, and from 18 somewhere. Mm -hmm. And in the intro, he says something like it's. I actually put it in, in a quotes in the beginning of the article, and I ended started. So I started with this quote, and it's like that he hoped in that time. That was 1880. That's 130 years ago. This magician when, and, and the other guy that philosophized and talked, and he said, "Well, they, our hope is in, in in the future, in the near future. The, every common man on the street will know that." The tricks are to the magician the same as the mask and the powder and the wigs are to the actor. You know, like that, you know, and, and how to get that there. I, it's not through commerciality of magic and making more magic tricks, although I'm a part of that commercial mm. market and I w it, it has to be there, but it's just like, oh, where's the school system? Why are we not trying to put this into the schools? Primary, after school activity, at least, like we're doing here in the European school or what you guys are trying to do to bring it into university programs yeah. where which is also something we maybe want to touch upon. Maybe it's the right time. We're almost halfway. Yeah, sure. Uh, if you want to touch on to... Oh, another big part of your life has been the Mystique group in yes. Sweden. <clears throat> um, I don't want to talk group. too much about it. It was because uh, you, you are the expert, but Tom Stone and you and so yeah, who, who else? Leif, uh, well, it started up like this. We had, uh, what was it, six, seven years ago, uh, Tom Stone and Johan Stoll uh, to known magicians for those of you in the business mm -hmm. started um, decided to to bring magic to the university so we had um, a couple of courses in uh, the Swedish dance and circus university mm -hmm. and I think we got people from 11 different nations and we were having courses of six weeks as a tryout and it got really well mm. uh, which year was that Oh, this must be six, seven years ago. Okay. Maybe even more. Mm. Can't remember. Time, I'm old now. Time flies. <laughs> Time, Time flies. flies. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and we learned a lot. Uh, uh, and it was not only we had Tom Stone as our head teacher who taught us a lot, but it wasn't only that. It was more of a, also a research. We mm -hmm. started researching uh, everything from uh, misdirection, you know, and to uh, perception vectors, uh, things like that, really advanced. And, and what happens if we do this instead of that in mm -hmm. magic? What happens if... Testing stuff as well. Testing stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, Trying to make a curriculum and find the way to... Yeah, we, we got this really, really absurd little drills that we were paired up, maybe two, three or four people, and uh, these are the conditions. You're going to use these techniques, for an example. You're going to do crossing the gaze two times and then one time wrong. Mm -hmm. And the subtext is going to be the inspector is coming. Okay. And boom, boom, boom. Okay. And you make up a magic routine. You got 45 minutes. Beautiful. So that that's already sounds way more different than you know when classical thinking of like traditional. Like, oh, either either go through a method or make up an effect and then. But this is just like you're taking a structure of a dramatic yeah. sequence that you would like. You have yeah. you're putting some subtext into it, yeah. and some theory, and see what happens. It. Yeah, yeah. 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 And th but then also we have to remember that everybody that joined these classes had done at least five, six, seven years of, of professional performing. Professional performing, yeah, yeah. and uh, they've studied them before. They yes. need to be on a certain level. Yeah, yeah, yeah needed yeah. to be on a certain level. Um, and it was fascinating. But when, when once we have done this, I remember a year after, I called Tom and I said, we should do something. <laughs> this is, you know, I'm bored, I want to do something. And uh, he said, yeah, we should do something. So we called two other guys, my uh, very good friend Leif Olberius, mm -hmm. whom I've been working with for the last 25 years. Hey Leif, miss you too. Yeah. Nice to uh, really come back soon. And we also brought in uh, John Henry Larsson, mm -hmm. a very good magician and uh, extremely good builder of stuff, ah. uh, a technical wizard. Um, and we got together, I remember the day we had coffee in our co favorite coffee place, and uh, 
And we decided to do something strange. And Tom came up with a basic idea that was, what happens if we create a show, one and a half hour show from scratch in 30 days, mm. and then we play it only once, <laughs> and then we throw it away. Mm. And then we take the next 30 days. I don't know if you're into stand-up comedy, but George Carlin used to do that. I don't know, he, he wrote a yeah. piece and threw it away. Yeah. It's gone. Kill your darlings. Exactly. And we decided to keep on doing this for three months. And uh, we didn't stop. Uh, we did four years. And uh, yeah, it's been quite stressful to be to produce a totally new show yeah. every, you know. Yeah. And then what we did was that we brought in guest artists. Uh, we never took any money from this project. All the money went back into the project mm -hmm. and to bring guest artists. And we had, uh, oh, we had them all. From Faye Presto, Miguel Munoz, Ooh, uh, nice. Javi Benitez, we've had uh, Wolfgang Moss, I don't know. Everybody's been there, basically. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and basically what we told them is that you can do whatever you want. Mm. And it's a non-profit thing. So basically, uh, we, we kept it on a low budget. Everybody, uh, our guest artist, has been so nice eagerly and willingly supporting this thank you so much for those of you who are seeing this yes uh, and it's been a good journey but what we did with mystique was that we sort of started bending i wouldn't say the rules because i don't think there are any rules yeah, yeah. but bending the normal way we we took very old tricks and we did them in a completely new way you want to talk about that exercise here and openly, or rather in the Patreon episode? Uh, it would be more for, for it the Patreon. would be more for the Patreon. Yeah, this but is more technical stuff. It's more technical stuff. But you could say that we, we put up a couple of ground rules that we're going to try to do our magic with as much as possible mm -hmm. on at least two, three, or four people. So not doing solo, sh solo performances, okay. but we want to do a group thing out of it. And we also decided that it would be interesting to see if we don't talk. Mm -hmm. We do everything to music. And to see how much can we communicate mm -hmm. uh, with the audience without talking. Yeah. And it turns out, in my opinion, and I think the other guys as well, that we are communicating better without talking. Yeah, you know. It gets a completely different way of communication. You Teller would agree. Body, Teller yeah. would agree. You need and to work uh, with your body and work yeah. with, with your eye movements. I like what Teller said. Yeah. And I don't know where. That's I a contradiction in terms. What Teller said. What Teller said. But funny, he yeah. said it somewhere. I think it was the master class or somewhere in, the, in where I heard him talking on a podcast somewhere in, in a sense that this. Uh, yeah, it's not, it's not always e easy to describe. But uh, yeah, well, how, how can you take, you know, something that you, when you start talking too much like even in like regular life the story that you're trying to tell somebody gets every time you say something and it's like double it can be taken differently or your body says something you uh, and you're not paying attention to how you're you know with your body and when you stop doing all this and talking which i do a, a lot you know me on stage yeah. there's uh you you if you want to really tell a story and they don't know where it's going, it's like they have to follow you along. It, you, the more you say, the the more you give them, the more they can go their own way around. It's a diff interesting concept, but it's so yeah. hard to pull off, like you said. Like it uh, is hard to pull off, but in the same time, we have to remember that. In, as my dear friend Leif, who is also not only a very extremely talented magician. Mm -hmm and a good friend, but also a, a very, very prominent actor. Mm. Uh, as he would say, which I, yeah, which is true, everything tells a story. Mm. All your props tell a story. Your clothes tell a story. Your eye movements tell a story. Everything tells a now story. Now that you reminded me, I have to wrap my own gear. <laughs> so everything oh. tells a story, uh, and we <laughs> have to remember that. Because uh, for those not listening, I took off my T-shirt. I have my 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 no my merch just for myself. Nobody can buy it. Yet. Oh, <laughs> but uh, guests will get it in the future when they Whoa come. <laughs> finally, yes. <laughs> Go to Holland. They said you'll have a T-shirt. They said, <laughs> oh yeah, cool. So no, everything tells a story, yeah. and uh, it doesn't necessarily. It can be your body language. Can be everything tells a story, and you need to get your pieces together because uh, yeah, if yeah. if 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 your body tells one story. 
right? And yeah. and and your your eyes tell another story, or your verbal communication yeah. tells another story. It gets sort of mixed up. Yeah, yeah, it's it's muddled, and with the same with me because I have a lot of energy. I had to learn how to. I'm still learning, trying to get better at f- like framing and focusing my energy on stage. One is the pacing round, which I love, like, but not in the way if it's not control, where it's like uh, back and mm. forth, but with a the, with the purpose and stopping and looking and going back and forth. I like dynamics, but it's like really been always too much for my side, and I had to learn from either the director that worked with me, um, Ria Marx, uh, thank you so much. She worked with uh, Hans Klock as well. I was lucky enough to to have somebody who had experience working yeah. with a magician on stage and she was like, hey, but yeah, you need to like, hear, when you're like this, the frame is like this big on stage. You, you want them to see this and that? Open up your body, that's the frame now, you know, yeah. and that kind of stuff. And when you learn diverse things like that, and that's why, I don't know, historians, I don't know if you heard, they call it the magic is the queen of the arts, which is kind of coming yeah. from magician, you'd never want to say that. <laughs> it's like, it's like well, who are you to pretentious bastards? Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but, uh, but it is like kind of, we, it's not only all arts, it's just also science. We try to learn as much as we can how to make the magic atmosphere come yeah, out. You need and to have a lot of skills. Yeah. Uh, I know, uh, but then, then on the other hand, you also need to know your limits. For example, mm. you mentioned the sand clown. Mm-hmm. Uh, the sand clown is the name of, of my the act a winning the act award yeah, winning award act. winning act woohoo oh, <laughs> anyway, I, I plugged it because you know you know are you like me probably you don't want to yeah, any somebody has to say it it's in the big somebody game. has to say it yeah yes uh, yeah I create I started creating an act nine years ago mm-hmm. uh, still not I was really lucky enough finished. to see it about three four times here in yeah. the Amsterdam show and it's still developing uh, mm-hmm. I basically I've never been a, a never been into competitions in magic but then tom stone the bastard <laughs> fooled me into getting into the swedish championships uh, oh i don't want to, pe- so to hear this uh, what you say because they've been like talking to me about it you need to go to yeah, competition yeah. but it was good uh and uh so i did the swedish championships and mm-hmm. uh did pretty well I, I won the grand prix which was fun mm-hmm. and then i decided uh okay I might as well try next edge. I went to the Nordic Championships, which is Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, mm-hmm. and crushed uh, it. Yeah, I got the Grand Prix, which was <laughs> crushed it. amazing, <laughs> amazingly funny. And then, um, uh, then I was competing in Blackpool on the uh, International Close-Up Magician of the Year, and uh, didn't win. Uh, Do Kim Moon from Korea won. Excellent act. Mm-hmm. That was like wow. Props to him. Yeah, oh yeah. Jesus Christ, that was good. And then uh, then I went to the European Championships in Manresa. And that was when? Uh, in July this 2021. 2021. Mm-hmm. And I got third place yeah. in Parlor. Yeah. And, uh, That's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. Because people don't understand how strict and also conservative and also like you have to know what these people want. Also, it's not just it's, it's your act, yeah. but you do want to apply certain things. Yeah. But the, the my point is also that creating this act, is, uh, I could never have done it alone. Mm. Never, ever. Not a chance in the whole world. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been using... You hear young magicians? Yeah. Listen to this. It's a real uh, world advice. I got. Adv- I also got advice that what I did was that I gathered a team around me, of mm-hmm. uh, not only because that they are professional, but people that I can work with, people that I can trust, people yeah. that I like, people that I want to go out and have a cup of coffee with, like people we said I in can the call when I'm having a bad day. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And one of them was Tom Stone, who's helped me enormously with with the magic part and the construction of the magic part, the, the form. Mm-hmm. And also the misdirection, Leif Olberius, who's done, well, the acting part. The acting, and the yeah. acting is a huge part of yeah. the Sand Clown Act. Mm. It's really important. Uh, we have Especially uh, with all the silence. Yeah, yeah, since I'm only doing it to music and yeah. need to work with the eyes and the movements of the body and stuff. Mm. And John Henry Larson, all the guys in the Mystic, John Henry's uh, helped me a lot with uh, the man is, you know, he's got a zillion ideas. And he knows how to build them all. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's, it gets too much sometimes. <laughs> he goes, oh, wait, stop. <laughs> and uh, Mickey Askenas, a very, very good builder, uh, also helped me with a lot of stuff, a lot of ideas. Um, and uh, Andreas Sebring from Metal Writing. Uh, it's 
helped me a lot. You need to get me all these like stuff that I can put them like, yeah. links or whatever. You will get it in order yeah, afterwards. But so, but yeah. without them, this this would never have been possible because. Uh, and also, when I went, for an example, to Blackpool to compete, I had uh, help mm. uh, with, from uh, Nicola Arcane, mm-hmm. Otto yeah. Kramer, so the, and, the, the, uh, the partner of uh, Thumbstone. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they were there and uh, you know helped me fixing the lights, uh, asking me, you know, I'm gonna let me get you a bottle of water because I didn't have the time to run off and do it. So, and, mm-hmm. and that was a relief to have that team. Because you're mm. so stressed yeah, in the situation. Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, when I went to Manresa, I was completely alone. Uh, and that was, yeah, you got your 10 minutes to do your tech. Mm. And uh, I learned the night before I was scheduled to perform that it was a leaning stage, 4% leaning. Oh, wow. Okay, that's unusual. And I do yeah. a cup and ball routine. Oh, no. And uh, I didn't really know how to handle this. So they, I got in the morning and half an hour earlier than everybody else trying to rebuild the table uh in the same time i was doing my tech to two technicians they needed a translator and i wasn't really sure did they get that you know the cues Mm -hmm. if i had had my my crew with me i would have sent somebody to the tech booth you know to run through all that and somebody would have taken care of this and all i would have done is to make sure my props are where they are yeah which is that's that's an advice if you're going to compete get your team together bring some friends let them help you because you cannot do it alone I mean, you could, but it, you're drowning, and, and, and things go wrong anyway. Yeah. And it's like you, the, the chances that they go wrong are much higher. Than yeah, you, yeah, and you get so stressed. And then you get get in this kind of situations, a leaning stage, where where, where I've never seen that before. But it, yeah, no, I it's guess. A, some sort of opera thing. It's a little bit leaning, but uh, yeah. And I spoke to the people in charge of the competition. I said, "Why didn't you tell me this?" And they went like, hmm. "Should have asked." <laughs> Should have asked. You know. So okay, that's also a lesson learned. Chalk check it up check to the it learning before, curve. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So now I'm I'm preparing to go to uh, <clears throat> to the big world championships in Quebec in uh, July. So how would, so uh, July 2022? How do you see then? Um, how do you start? Do you have a time frame where you begin? Because you have you're still building, you're working on the act. But do I you am, start training like before to really get? Uh, yeah, I, b- I would never stop practicing after of course, European yeah. championships. <laughs> I actually didn't touch the act for a month. Okay. I needed holiday because wow. I've been working with it uh, so intense for nine years. Yeah. Uh, well, five years. I've been working th- with it for nine years, but yeah, intense. But you for need five to years. also let things breathe. Yeah. Did you see the act differently when you came back after a month? Yeah, I did because uh, uh, I needed to change a few parts. Mm-hmm. I needed to add a few parts, mm-hmm. and I'm adding it right now. Uh, but now the problem is that <clears throat> the act is, which is now eight minutes thirty-seven seconds, is. It's so planned that if I change anything in the beginning, it will create problems in the end. Yeah. And people very often, I meet fine magicians. Swiss watch. Yeah, fine. Yeah, fine watch goes like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people say to me, "Look, this effect. You should take this effect and put it in your act." And I go, "It's a great effect, but that would change my whole story because everything is telling a story." And yeah. then I need to. Ch- so I can't just put anything in just yeah, because yeah. it's good magic. It's not like you have like an act like most of us have at the Amsterdam Magic Show where you're like, oh, I have this trick that's how to connect maybe a bit emotionally together. But but it's like not like one c- continuous storyline and exactly. that has a curve and then ends. Because and needs, this needs, I need to look at my character and I need to ask, uh, and my character is the sad clown. Basically, uh, the act is about the man who turns around to the audience and he's got a red nose and he's a clown and he doesn't want to be but a clown. you start behind stage like as if you're behind stage yeah i'm coming out from another from another show and they're getting and to see you behind the stage yeah, getting to see me backstage what happens to you emotionally and yeah and all i want to do is get rid of the red nose yeah. uh, i don't want to be a clown anymore and in the end i still have to put on the red nose so yeah. and that's also part of a thing that that we worked a lot within Mystique, and that mm. is, does magic necessarily have to be funny? Does it necessarily have to be the big happy ending thing yeah. where everybody's laughing? And yeah. we say no. Yeah. Uh, we've done a lot of really dark things. Uh, great, man. Great. There needs to be like diversity, and because it's mainstream yeah. will always be mainstream, but it's like mainstream can change if enough fringe things like this happen, and it's you know. Yeah. 
beautiful like it's do you want to like because we talked about the videos for the mystic you yeah. want to include them in the public just and we'll not talk about too much technical stuff we can tell the people who are listening what's happening and those who are watching on youtube will get to see a little bit of a small screen on the uh but in the patreon you want to go a bit more technical yeah. through them and, and explain so, yeah. why and but if we should see something now Yes, yeah. let's, let's let's do that, so and uh, we have? you will. We have either the sign of silk routine, milk mystery, or cookies. What, what do you want? Oh. Well, the cookies is one of my favorites. Uh, let me tell you the background story. Yes. This one was filmed in the uh, the Magic Castle in uh, Hollywood, and uh, I'm not on stage, but my two friends John Henry and Thomas, and we decided to make a small piece about a cookie. Mm -hmm. So we should start the act, and if you want to just. Just for our listeners yeah. who are listening, explain what just the details, what's happening, yeah. if you can. Uh, I'll maybe include a little bit of, if... Here we go. That was in Magic Castle, right? Yes. Performance. Two guys. Oh. One has a silk. No. Was it a napkin? <laughs> it can be whatever you want. But he be, makes yeah. it a napkin, huh? Yeah, he makes it a napkin. Uh, yeah. Okay, and there's Tom Stone on the right, watching confused. What is he doing? Oh, cookies. Hey, I have a silk. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Tom is hungry as well. Yeah. And desperately wants a cookie. And then John Henry, well, okay, well, you can have a if cookie. You, if yeah. you insist, yeah. So they take a bite of the cookie, both of them. Yeah, and here, here's where the weird part starts. Oh, Tom spits back his cookie to yeah. him. <laughs> and it heals the cookie. It's restored. And John oh. Henry restores Tom's cookie but by the, spitting it. And then they try to bite, but they're all disgusted by their own. So they switch the cookies. <laughs> and now they completely yeah. out. Oh, so now John Henry eats his cookie. The whole cookie. Yeah. And Tom spits back the cookie. Okay. And John takes the cookie and eats the whole. Oh, no, it disappears from his hands. Oh. Hey. Two magicians at <laughs> war. <laughs> Tom just takes all of his cookies. Hey, that's not fair. Oh, okay, he's being reasonable. And then he gives back one cookie and steals all the others. Yes, <laughs> and then steals the last cookie as well. Yeah. Yeah, bastard, Tom. I love you. And here we can see John Henry has failed utterly. Huh. Now, now Leif, no, normally, normally you would make this, you know, a turnaround. So he and now a third person came in. Leif came in with a big, a little small suitcase or chest, treasure chest. <gasps> he has a cookie. Yeah, and he wants the cookie. Of course. John Henry wants the cookie, but Leif eats it. Ah. Hey, he's so nice to even. Yeah, take care of the crumbs. John Henry can eat the crumbs. Yeah. Oh, the crumbs! I didn't even notice that before. Oh, yeah, beautiful! That's, and that's the ending of this trick. They, it, there's no magic ending. There's basically uh, an ending of confusion and some new storyline. Yeah, and a guy being sad and because guy, he didn't get any cookies. Yeah, wow. But it's also a way of doing magic, you know. It's uh, yeah, and it's a class. It's a little little trick we we got to see in a couple a couple of years ago. It came out. Uh, we call it the bite cookie. Yeah. And you know you can look it up, but it's not. But it's like it's such a these visual, visual tricks are usually tell. You should tell a long story, and then the, the trick should, that's visual and short. You should like make a long beginning to to make it. Yeah. But in this way, you guys have made this one thing, which is usually ten seconds long or five seconds long, and built a, a whole act. And we will discuss the actual structure and why and where it comes from. And it's it's not from magic, so. Um, and that will be in the Patreon, so subscribe there, follow us there. We appreciate all your support. Yep. Um, you want to go and check out one last video, and then we'll kind of, let's say, then we're going to make an ending uh, the conversation and end the discussion here. Which one would you like, the sign of silk or milk mystery? I would go for the sign of silk. Nice. Because what we did with that was that we took a very standard disappearing silk trick that people normally do all by themselves. Yes. And we decided to see what a classic happens. of magic. Yeah, what happens if we do it more people, mm -hmm. and we build a pattern around it, uh, which is this is built on an old clown pattern, mm -hmm. ABA, ABB, ABC. We'll talk more about that. In yes, the, in the Patreon thing. Um, and yeah, it uses a lot of misdirection. It uses a classic of magic mm -hmm. and. Uh, 
Here but we go. Check it out. Yeah, it's interesting Let's when there's it. more people. Yeah. Let's see this sign of silk by Mystique. Again, performed in the Magic Castle. No, this is this is, oh, this this is, is an Uppsala magic ah, comedy. Is, yeah. Ah, okay, I see. Yeah, you once told me this very good convention. Uppsala so magic we see comedy. Martin on stage. There's a sign in Swedish. It says the vanishing seal. How do you say that? Pronounce that. Den fär den försvinnande duken. Okay. The vanishing seal. The vanishing seal. Or the disappearing seal. Yes. Okay. And I see the sign, and I think, okay, okay. Um, is that what I'm gonna do? Okay. Do I have a silk? Yeah, I have a oh, silk. Oh, he has a silk in his pocket. A red silk. Who would have thought a magician? Who would have thought, yeah. Pushes the silk in the yeah. fist. Classic. All the fingers go in there. Push it. And it... Hey, you failed. Yeah, I know. It doesn't disappear. I'm a lousy magician. And I, I turn around and I look at the sign again, you know. Uh -huh. But it says the disappearing silk. It should work. Yeah, it should, it should work. If the sign says so. And I try and it one more time. Oh, come on, Martin. Yeah, I know. It's terrible. And it's this times of crisis you call for a friend. So uh, I'm trying to get Leif <laughs> out on stage. Because as I said, he's a, hey, a wonderfully he's a talented magician. Yeah, please help, friend. And then I show him. Okay. And I show him it doesn't disappear. And then we both look at the sign. Yeah, yeah it says the disappearing silk. Try it one more time. And then Leif decides to look for himself. He sees the silk in my hand, and then he it's takes still there. it. He takes it, shows you what to do. Places it, the red silk in his hand. And it's gone. And it's back in my hand. Yay. I hope just this doesn't, this doesn't take us off of the... Uh, is this uh, copyrighted music, probably, yeah? <laughs> we'll take care of it later. Yeah. If it's needed. We'll and then him. Tom enters. And, and Tom I show enters. him. So I show him. And now my silk is gone. Hmm. And it turns out it's in Tom's hand. Yeah. Wow. Now you made it. Yeah, and then Tom tries it. And then you, I decide take to take it, it from him. From his hand, mm -hmm. and we look at it, and I place it in my hand, and now Tom opens his hand, and he's got a red silk. I have a red ah, silk. Ah, all of you have red it. silk. All of you. So we all have three have red silks. What to do? Now all of you go. Try it again. Into the into the hand, push it into the fist. All three of us, and Tom. Tom's Success. gone, mine's gone, uh, <laughs> and Leif has a yellow silk. A yellow one. Huh. And we all get really confused, and he, uh, yeah, Leif leaves with Leif is, is, is happy. Yeah, he's he got, happy. He got a good trick. And then we look at the sign. <gasps> oh, and it says the color changing silk. Yeah. Pronounce that in Swedish. Then uh, the duken. Okay, okay. Yeah. We, got, we got the... Wow. Okay. So Beautiful. that's also a way of taking an old old standard trick and sort of make it different. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think we did enough of talking through the, the thing to not have the music pick up and it's uh, fine. Hey, this is great. Now, we don't want to push an hour if it's naturally not feeling an hour, so we're going we're gonna to end it here. Unless you wanted to talk more about we've went through a lot of subjects from dementia, from uh, your Japan, Aikido... You've really made a nice introduction. I hope you come back as soon as possible and we'll see what we do then. We might discuss more things openly about other stuff, but in the Patreon, we're going to go there now and, uh, and have ourselves a, a great time. But if you're ready, come ready with your brain. He's going to explain some uh, misdirection concepts and uh, he's had a lot, a lot to share where, where he's, like he said, learn from Tom Stone and from acting and from... And there's uh, some I, other I, concepts I, that might surprise you. I think I hopefully will be able to explain it. You yes, we'll, 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 we'll try. That's always what we try. We try to be as clear with what we want to uh, express, but, you know, we're human. So we'll do our best. And uh, for all of you checking us out again here on, on YouTube, thank you. Subscribe, like, all that stuff that we don't like to say, but please do it. It helps yeah. us in the algorithm. <laughs> uh, so we'll see you next time. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, sir.